Ever wanted to be suspended in a ball several thousand feet in the air? How about running around in the open and being shot at by snipers while armed with nothing but a few lengths of cable to protect yourself? Or flying speeding planes straight toward the enemy and to your own doom? Better hurry up and make your choice. This is war, Sonny. We're going through the worst jobs you could have while fighting in World War II. So how about something all the way at the top, and we're not talking about the top brass. By the top, we mean the sky. World War II revolutionized aerial combat, so it accounted for more fatalities than ever before. And it wasn't just the enemy bomber planes that posed a threat of death. Sometimes it was the Allies' own aircraft that could be just as deadly for the crews manning them. Given their close proximity to Nazi-occupied France, British bomber crews were often sent on air raids, flying directly over the enemy and raining down explosive ordnance on key strategic positions in much the same way the Luftwaffe was attacking England. Over the course of the war, thousands of British bombing missions were conducted, and the air crews flying over the enemy territory hardly had a single flight that didn't involve what we'll call turbulence. Assignments like these were some of the most dangerous jobs during World War II, thanks in large part to the bombardment of oncoming fire from flak weaponry fired by the enemy. What's flak, you ask? Well, it's the term given to the 88mm anti-aircraft artillery gun used by the Nazis throughout World War II, taken from the German word Flugabwehrkanone, meaning air defense cannon. Flak came to be used as a general term for any incoming fire from ground level intended to take out aircraft. These flak guns could be fired with deadly accuracy, their shells large enough to shred their way through the exterior of a bomber, breaking airborne formations while Nazi dogfighters swooped in to launch counterattacks against inbound British planes. Inevitably, a lot of things could go wrong on air raids like this, and they often did. The crews aboard each plane had limited options for getting themselves out of a jam if they were in trouble. Supplies like bandages and other essentials for performing quick first aid were so scarce that dealing with injuries became near impossible. Sometimes the more severely wounded crew members were actually thrown out of their aircraft. Not to worry though, they were at least given a parachute for the trip down. Of course, their missions took them over enemy-occupied territory, so if the Nazi soldiers rounded them up wherever the injured crew members landed, they'd likely be very lucky if they were patched up and sent off to a POW camp rather than being given 20 cc's of lead to the back of their skull, followed by a recuperative trip to a shallow ditch. Flying over enemy territory in any aircraft was a dangerous endeavor, so it's no wonder it was considered one of the worst jobs during World War II. Throughout the war, the United States 8th Air Force suffered around 48,000 casualties, with the majority of them being air crews and some members of ground crews responsible for their aircraft. For those in bomber units, the mortality rate was particularly bad. Around half were likely to lose their lives, meaning the chances of surviving one of those air raid missions was nearly 50-50. Of all the bomber crews who served with the 8th Air Force, 80% of them were lost during the war. They had the highest casualties of any major American unit throughout the Second World War. If you don't think you could hack it as part of a bomber crew, then we might have an opening in one of the most dangerous, I mean coveted, jobs in the whole war effort. Take a look over here, Sonny, and say hello to your new job as a ball turret gunner. Hey, stop that giggling. Okay, listen, we were lying before about this being a coveted position. Actually, it's anything but. You need to have really good aim and be good with heights. As the name suggests, a ball turret was a spherical mounted gun turret fitted to a number of US aircraft. Most famously, the B-17 Flying Fortresses and the B-24 Liberator were deployed with turrets like these. They were typically found on the underside of the plane, a tiny, lightly armored ball that a single crew member had to squeeze inside. These unlucky gunners had to spend hours in the fetal position, taking constant heavy fire from enemy flat guns. And worst of all, the ball turret was so small, there was no space for a parachute, meaning that if their plane were shot down, gunners would usually have no quick way of bailing out. Instead, they need to climb back into the main body of the plane, put on a parachute, and then join the rest bailing out, all before their aircraft crash-landed or worse. The dangers of enemy fire and the long-term posture problems were hardly the only issues faced by ball turret gunners. Given the high altitudes and freezing temperatures, there was a strong risk that oxygen lines to the ball turret could freeze while in flight, cutting off the gunner's air supply. Add to that fact that these spherical turrets with lightweight armor were the favored target for attacking Nazi fighter pilots, and you're stuck tens of thousands of feet in the air in the worst seat on the whole plane. Should have booked a first class ticket, although there's maybe slightly more legroom in economy class these days than you could find in one of these turret pods, each normally only 4 feet wide. 
Ball turret gunners weren't exactly defenseless sitting ducks, though, as most of the ball turret gunners were charged with operating a pair of twin Browning AN M2 50 caliber machine guns, each with 250 rounds of ammunition. The ball turret was designed to rotate a full 360 degrees, meaning that the gunners inside could keep their Brownings trained on their targets without having to take their finger off the trigger if an enemy plane zipped out of their eyeline. Well, not that they could actually pull the trigger on their Browning machine guns, given how cramped the ball turrets were. The handles of the armaments were difficult to maneuver, so instead gunners had to resort to a pulley system in order to successfully operate their turrets. Although it might have taken a while to master, a well-practiced ball turret gunner could pose a significant threat to Nazi fighter planes, which is why they were often the first thing that enemy pilots would target. So in order to get enough practice to be a crack shot, you'd have to survive just being inside the pod itself. However, while coming with a whole host of reasons not to get in one, there is one popular myth that makes the ball turret gunner's job seem unsafe in a way it actually wasn't. Being situated on the underside of the plane, there's a common misconception that the gunner could become stuck inside the turret ball and get crushed to death by the plane's weight if the landing gear failed. In actuality, the design of the ball turret varied slightly between aircraft, with the landing gear of the B-24 allowing for a retractable mount. The B-17's conventional landing gear meant its turrets had to be on a non-retractable mount, but this still left around 15 inches of ground clearance beneath the plane's belly as long as the machine guns weren't facing straight down, which they often needed to be to access the exit hatch. So flying over enemy targets, dangling beneath aircraft with two Brownings, hardly any armor, and every enemy fighter in the air gunning for you, sounds like the job you want, huh? Wait, what's that? You get airsick, do you? Well, isn't that convenient? All right, we'll mark you down as unsuitable for positions that involve flying. How about instead, we get you on the water? Let's see here. Haha, <laughs> perfect. You, my boy, could sign up with the Merchant Mariners. One of the most important military roles that the Allied forces played during World War II was the delivery of vital war materials to countries that needed them. Given the scale of the conflict, trade across the world had been massively disrupted. Enter the Merchant Navy, otherwise known as Merchant Mariners. American steamship companies chartered boats to help meet the high demand for fuel and supplies that the United States Army and their allies needed in order to continue the war effort. Hauling cargo across the ocean, while not always life-threatening under normal circumstances, was made all the harder by the war. Different parts of the ocean often fell under territories of occupying armies and navies, not to mention the back-breaking physical labor normally involved with working on a cargo ship. One of the most dangerous supply routes for the merchant marines was the Murmansk Run during which ships would have to sail through dangerous icy waters of the Arctic and had to attempt to avoid Norway, which was under Nazi control, in order to reach the ports of Archangel and Murmansk, controlled by the Soviet Union. As if facing extreme frostbiting cold in difficult waters wasn't enough, these convoys of supply boats were often subjects of attacks by Nazi submarines, battleships, and aircraft, making an effort to cripple the Allies' supply lines. Given the sheer danger being faced, casualties often ran high, with approximately 9,300 sailors of the United States Merchant Navy losing their lives in order to transport vital cargo. These were crews made not of soldiers but of people employed by shipping companies and those who had previously only worked on passenger vessels. While some of the ships were given armaments for their defense in the form of deck guns manned by United States Navy troops, the Merchant Mariners still suffered a casualty rate that rivaled many branches of the U.S. military. They lost 33 ships per week, with one out of every 26 mariners dying over the course of the war. Mariners had to face the threat of torpedo attacks and their ships sinking, and if they managed to survive, they'd need to get right back on another ship as soon as they recovered. Sadly, their sacrifices and the high casualties suffered by the merchant marines have done little to leave them a lasting legacy for their role in shaping the tides of World War II. For a long time, the merchant marines weren't even considered a significant enough part of the United States' war effort to be granted veteran benefits. Left mostly underpraised compared to other branches of service, it was only in 1988 that this was set right. Well then, you're ready to set sail? Nah, no, we imagine not. It's hard to make the merchant mariners sound like an appealing job when they ended up being heavy on casualties and far too light on recognition for their efforts. What's that? You're worried about leaving the country, huh? Why? Just what are you hiding? You're not in trouble with the law, are you, son? Committing crime never pays, especially while there's a war on. But if you were part of the Soviet forces during World War II, you could have enlisted in a penal military unit, whether you liked it or not. 
In 1942, Stalin issued an order to establish special military units that would be placed at the front lines. These weren't some new breed of paratroopers or any other highly trained soldiers. Instead, these units were comprised of exclusively convicts. The idea was to punish any displays of cowardice and dissent against the Soviet Union by making these criminals active participants in the war. The penal units of the Red Army were where convicted or court-martialed Soviet soldiers were sent. Any of them who had deserted their post or retreated also qualified, as specified by Stalin himself. These special units were then made to fight in some of the Second World War's most dangerous environments, with some penal units even being ordered to run through minefields, clearing the way for regular troops. Needless to say, they were viewed and treated as expendable by Russian generals. They were almost like some kind of suicide squad. Over the course of the war, the Soviets expanded their penal units, going from mainly including deserters and court-martialed soldiers to later taking in all kinds of criminal offenders. This even meant that some of Russia's prisoners of war were then punished for having surrendered to the Nazis by being placed in penal units. It might have been better than being executed, but it can't have been the preferred option. And really, if many credible reports of the Wagner mercenary group recruiting operatives out of Russian prisons for the Ukraine war in the modern day are to be believed, not much has changed over in the motherland. Count yourself lucky if you aren't on the wrong side of the law, son, otherwise you could end up fighting on the front. The one place you're hoping to avoid. Listen, how about something that only requires you to be on the battlefield for a short while? You wouldn't even be there to fight, just do some technical tasks to help out our boys in the infantry. Let me see here, where did I leave that request for new field radio teams and wire layers? You see, in order to transmit messages from command to the front lines, the Allies needed radio bases that would relay the messages. But while you might be thinking of more modern wireless radios, this was back in the 1940s, don't forget. That means that communication of this nature involved needing a physical wire for command's messages to travel through. No problem, right? All you need is someone capable of laying that wire. Actually, the problem with this job is that those radio wires would often have to cut through certain areas that weren't exactly safe. Any unlucky soldier given the task of being a cable dog would be sent through open areas with nothing but a spool of telephone wire on his back. Whether he crawled or walked, being out in the open meant that field radio teams and wire layers were exposed, leaving them right in the line of sight of waiting enemy snipers. Snipers would often target military officers as a priority, then secondarily any soldier who looked to be of importance, and this normally included the ones tasked with setting up comms. After all, they were looking to take out enemy communications, and should the person with that vital component for receiving important messages wander into their crosshairs, then killing them would leave the opposing army in the dark. Whenever these soldiers weren't being shot at by snipers, their duties mainly involved sitting in a small bunker on the front lines with a telephone. Or some could be part of a squad and carry a large field radio on their back, which the squad's commander could use to relay messages back to command. The job of field radio operators put soldiers right in the middle of the action, and much like wire layers, it made these troops high priority targets. Snipers aiming for the antennas on the battlefield made this job one of the most dangerous on the front lines during World War II, especially because planes and artillery units would target them too. Okay, that was a long shot, not unlike a sniper. Terrible joke, I know, but you want something with more cover, less running around on the battlefield, and at least some kind of large protective barrier between you and oncoming fire. Well, how about becoming a submariner? Think about it, you'll be deep beneath the ocean, in an overcrowded steel tube filled with other crew members that are sometimes called iron coffins, but it can't be any more dangerous than that, right? Oh, right, torpedoes, fired from enemy submarines. Most torpedoes had a propeller and a limited fuel supply to carry them toward a target, which meant that they had limited range. An enemy sub would have to be close enough to land a shot on yours, but if one hit, that torpedo would prove highly effective at sinking ships and submarines alike. Sometimes torpedoes could get too good at sinking vessels too, occasionally prone to circle runs. This occurred when a torpedo would drift too far to one side, traveling in a circle, only to impact and detonate at the sub that fired it. Beyond the threat of torpedoes, both their own and the enemies, sailors also had to make sure that the diesel fumes from the sub didn't vent or that nothing on board caught fire. Given the limited oxygen on a submarine shared by its crew, either of those scenarios would lead to everyone dying by asphyxiation. Add that to the list of perpetual worries, the numerous mechanical failures that could cause a sub to suddenly sink, which the crew of the USS Squalus learned when a catastrophic valve failure caused the submarine to flood and sink to the bottom of the ocean. Alright, we can tell you got some reservations about being in a submarine. How about something less crowded, something where you'd be the only person involved? 
You could even get a zip around outside of the confines of the sub and take in the underwater sights, for a few short moments anyway, as a torpedo pilot. During World War II, multiple countries developed a similar idea in order to give their torpedoes improved range and accuracy when fired underwater. Just so happened that the idea in question was convincing crew members to physically steer the torpedo as it was sent hurtling toward an enemy submarine or a ship. In the version of this concept developed by the Nazis, the torpedo pilot would be seated inside a capsule on top of the torpedo. This part didn't contain any explosives, but it was used to drive the torpedo directly toward an enemy target. Once it reached a close enough range, the lower portion of the torpedo would detach from the top, primed for detonation, and propel itself forward to make a hit. Meanwhile, the pilot would steer clear of the underwater explosion, at least in theory. The tactic didn't work very often. Huh, wonder why? Seemed foolproof. Torpedo pilots were likely to get caught in the blast and killed, or sometimes would find that the release to detach the lower torpedo wouldn't work, blowing them to smithereens. Some versions of these early guided torpedoes were far less sophisticated too, consisting of just a seat on top of a shell, with the pilot simply having to make a swim for it once the ocean ordnance was correctly lined up with a straight shot toward an enemy ship. We had you interested there for a moment. Your ears pricked up when we mentioned a job you could do on your own. How about this? We know you said you don't like to fly, but what if there was a posting that involved you piloting a plane, but you'd only be in the air for a very few brief moments? The catch? Nah, there's no catch. How could you even imply that? Well, okay, there's one catch. As part of your job, you'd have to crash your plane, and you wouldn't have a very high chance of surviving. For many Japanese kamikaze pilots in World War II, the prospect of dying for their emperor was considered a great honor and the ultimate way to fulfill their lives. Their job was literally to die during their missions, but these pilots wholeheartedly believed that they would be remembered in infinite glory. While not a job anyone in the Allied forces endorsed or practiced, the kamikaze pilot was certainly a job with significantly lower rates of survival than most. Even though this wasn't a position you could be in on the Allied forces, it was still technically the job with the lowest survival rate. But as wild as this might sound, kamikaze was considered an honorable way to die which meant that there was no shortage of prospective people signing up for the job. The word kamikaze translates into divine wind in Japanese. Kamikaze pilots would load their aircraft up with plenty of explosives and then fly directly into enemy ships. These attacks often struck with horrifying accuracy, accompanied by a massive explosion. Not that it was easy flying so close to a battleship armed to the teeth with weapons that could shoot down a kamikaze pilot before he had a chance to get close enough to enact the explosive finale of his mission. Okay, you don't want to be blown up. Understandable. That's a reasonable wish that I think a lot of us can relate to. How about dealing with something that's already blown up? It's a simple and easy job to do. Just think of it like being a janitor, except for on a battlefield. Perhaps one of the bleakest and least glamorous jobs during the Second World War was body recovery and disposal. Having to sift through the aftermath of gruesome and bloody conflict is hardly anyone's idea of a good time. The job involved disposing of corpses that certainly wouldn't have been a picture to look at, with many bodies left burned, bloated, and rotting in various states of decay and damage. If an explosion had blown any bodies apart, then it was a guessing game of which pieces belonged to which corpses. They were also tasked with identifying which of their fellow soldiers had fallen, putting body parts back together in order for the remains to be buried, and then digging them up again when it came time for the bodies to be sent back home. The American cemetery at Colleville overlooking Omaha Beach, Normandy, contains the graves of 10,000 soldiers. Only 40% of them are marked, with the rest remaining unidentified, with the phrase, here rests a comrade in arms, known but to God. Didn't think you'd go for that one either. There's one noted right here at the bottom, but since you've opted out of everything else, you probably wouldn't be interested in being a flamethrower operator. Oh, you actually seem excited by that one, really? Well, it might sound like a cool action-packed position, wielding a flame-spewing death machine on the battlefield might just burn you in ways you wouldn't expect. Flamethrowers are widely considered controversial weapons, given that they are capable of inflicting some truly gruesome physical injuries. The United States was actually the last major military superpower in World War II to develop and deploy portable flamethrowers on the battlefield. However, they quickly became the biggest proponent of these newly developed weapons. This gave the soldiers of the US Army front row seats to the horrific effects that flamethrowers could inflict on enemy soldiers. In many of the earlier models, heavy, cumbersome fuel tanks had to be carried on the backs of soldiers with flamethrowers in order to operate them. This added weight naturally slowed them down, and much like field radio teams, made them a priority target for enemy snipers. It would only take a slight puncture and a spark from a bullet 
in order to ignite the fuel within the tank, meaning the moment a sniper caught sight of them, a soldier with a flamethrower was as good as dead. Additionally, flamethrowers weren't very effective at long ranges when compared to rifles and machine guns, so to compensate for this, soldiers had to get much closer to their targets to take them down. When they did, provided they could make it close enough without being shot, while carrying a heavy fuel tank, this meant that the soldiers had to watch other people slowly burning alive, with the knowledge that they had been the one to do that to another person. In some instances, as if it wasn't already dangerous enough, soldiers made their flamethrowers somehow even more deadly by attaching their bayonets to the muzzle where the flame was expelled. They would then use this to stab enemy soldiers, then pull the trigger of their flamethrower in order to burn them from the inside, which would have made for a slow, horrific death. There is little doubt that the flamethrower was a gruesome, horrendous weapon. Whatever it lacked in range, it made up for with the devastating, cruel capability of destruction, burning anyone and anything alive within moments. They weren't even safe for those tasked with wielding them either. Given that once lit on fire, it could still take some time for an unfortunate soldier to die from immolation. Enemy troops, while still ablaze, would no doubt in unspeakable agony, still potentially attack the flamethrower operator with their final moments of life sentencing them both to the same fiery fate. Total immolation by flamethrower is certainly an unnecessarily painful and inhumane way for a human being to die, but during World War II this was widely and wrongly considered to be a mercy killing among the United States forces. The US Chemical Warfare Service had mischaracterized immolation to such a degree owing to a series of first-hand accounts from soldiers who had used the weapons during World War II. They described the deaths of the soldiers they had killed and many wholeheartedly believed that the use of the flamethrower led to quick, painless deaths. There was even a lack of understanding when it came to just how lethal flamethrowers could be. Even if they weren't being used to burn people alive at that precise moment, these flamethrowers could still pose an indirect threat to anyone around. Most accounts regarding the use of flamethrowers in the field failed to mention the risks of hypoxia or carbon monoxide poisoning that the weapons could inflict. Look, we've gone through some of the worst jobs you could possibly have, and yet there's still nothing you're suited for. At this rate, we're probably going to be here until VE Day. Now check out Worst War Crimes Committed by the United States During World War II, or watch this video instead.